I try to read through the gospel accounts that lead up to this event. I, I always want to start going through the end of each gospel and, and refreshing my mind of, of what led up to this wonderful event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this time around, as I was reading Mark, I came across a verse that hit me in a way maybe never before. It just really struck me. Now let me set the scene for you. Jesus and His disciples have just finished what is commonly called the Last Supper. You've seen the pictures. You've heard of the Last Supper. They had, they had just finished this. It was the Passover meal that Jesus said he, was, he just couldn't wait to have with them and enjoy it with them. He had passed the cup. He had passed the, the bread. And we just took part in what He established for us to do in remembrance of Him this morning. We took part of that in communion this morning. They had just had this event together. They had just celebrated the first communion. Jesus and His disciples, now minus Judas, because Judas had left to go get the uh, mob that would arrest Jesus. So Jesus and the eleven plus some, there was more than the eleven with Him, plus some, are coming to the garden or have been in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus often would bring them and they would often come to this garden and pray. It was a favorite place of His. So they had come to this place after the Passover meal. And Jesus in this place, the very famous prayers where He said, Lord, let this cup pass before Me, but nevertheless, not My will, but Your will be done. He prayed this three times and sweat great drops of blood. Now Judas, after all of this, shows up with a mob. It says that it's a, it's a crowd, and they're, they're carrying torches, and clubs, and swords, and they've come to arrest Jesus. And Judas walks up to Jesus, and he kisses him on the cheek, because he said, the one that I kiss, that's the one. That's the one you're going to arrest. And he's done all of that. And now as we've led up, we read in Mark chapter 14, verse 50, we read this. Then they all forsook him and fled. Then they all forsook him and fled. They ran. They took off. They scattered. And they left Jesus behind. They, who had walked with Him for the past three years, had given up their livelihoods, had forsaken their lives. They who knew firsthand of His love and His grace and His goodness. They who had witnessed the healing power and miracles of their Lord. They who had seen Him walk on water. They had seen Him give sight to the blind. They had seen Him raise Lazarus from the dead. They all forsook Him. And they fled. Maybe this is you this morning. You were following. You were walking. Then things got rough. It didn't go down the way you thought it was going to go down. The situation got hairy. And you forsook Him. And you fled. Maybe you've been running for years. Maybe you're still running. Maybe you're still scared. 
these disciples were terrified. And they ran. They fled. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Looking at Acts 4.23, this was just a short time in the future, maybe a month or two. And we know it's 40 days before the Spirit came, and this is right after the Spirit. So I'm going to say two months tops from that event. Two months tops. And we read, and with great power, this is the same they, these are those that had just fled two months ago and forsook Him on the night He needed them the most. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So what happened? What happened that took they who forsook and fled and turned them into the apostles that with power gave witness to the resurrected Lord? What happened? The resurrection happened. That's what happened. The resurrection happened by proclaiming the resurrection with power. They were proclaiming the power of the resurrection. For in the lives of these ordinary men, sometimes we think, man, these were the apostles. These were fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, and men just like you and me. These were regular people. Nothing special. The kind of people that forsake and flee when things got rough. That's who these guys were. And here they are, two months later, risking their lives, putting it all on the line, and proclaiming with power the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, right now, on this Resurrection Sunday, we have gathered together to give witness with power that Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. And He is alive right now. Today. Jesus who was crucified for the sins of the whole world rose from the dead just three days later. And He's alive. And I'm giving witness to you today with power. I can speak with authority and tell you He has risen indeed. Jesus is alive. The power of the resurrection is the very power of God to save you and to save me this very morning from our sins. God will count us righteous, holy, and perfect through the sacrifice, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see... We all have this problem. You and me. All of us. Every last one of us. We all sin. Sin isn't a word we like to hear, and it's not a word that's used very much today, but it's a very appropriate word. It means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. It's kind of an archery term. right? They wouldn't hit a bullseye. They're just off. They missed the mark. They sinned. We all have within us, it was passed down to us from generation to generation, from Adam, the first one to sin, the first one to break God's commandment. And from him on, we have inherited this nature. And this sin nature gives us a propensity. It's just a big word that means a bend towards sin. 
It is our natural bend towards sin. That's how we are. Every last one of us. And we've all sinned. As the Bible says, without exception. Romans 3.23 reads, For everyone has sinned. It's kind of plain. I know it's really clear. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Because here's the thing. That standard, well, it's perfection. It's perfection. Matthew 5.48 reads, But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So raise of hands. Who here is pulling that off this morning? Anyone? Are there any perfect people in the house? Put my hand down. And if you put your hand up, well, then you just lied, so... Nobody's perfect. Christ alone was perfect. Let me make it clear for you. Heaven is not a place for good people. If you got that idea somewhere, you were misled or you've misunderstood. Heaven is for sinners who have been redeemed by the only perfect person. Heaven is for sinners. Heaven is filled with sinners because there are no good people. We have all missed the mark. We all have this sin problem. We've all lied. When God, who is the eternal judge and the one who sets the standard, has said very clearly, do not lie. But every one of us has lied. We've all loved something or someone more than God when He has said, you shall have no other gods before Me. Jesus said, if you look after a woman with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. And women, you don't escape that either. He said, if you've hated someone, you are guilty of murder. No one escapes these things. We're all guilty. Myself and every one of us included. There's no way around it. We've all sinned. The Bible even declares in James 2.10, for the person who keeps all the laws, except one, is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's law. The Bible's kind of heavy on this. It's pretty straightforward. Really can't get around it. It's pretty clear. This is the reality. These are the facts. You and I, and everyone else, has broken God's law. You go, okay, well, can I outweigh? Can I, like, do more good than bad? Or can I earn, can I, like, earn it back? Is there, like, a, a program I can get into where if I, like, take these five steps, I can kind of erase the bad I've done and, and, and not have it held against me? This news about us breaking God's law, it's actually really bad news. It's, it's really bad news because the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. There's, there's no program in place to allow you to work your way out of this hole that we are all in. We will get what we deserve if we stand on our own and that is death. And when the Bible talks about death, well, in most cases, it's not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. Hell is a real place. It's a real place. I wish it wasn't. I wish I could tell you that hell doesn't exist and that in the end, everyone escapes it. I wish that was the story. 
But it's not. Hell is real. And it's forever. But this verse, Romans 6.23, it keeps going. It keeps going. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't just say, hey, let me tell you, you've all sinned. You broke his commandment. The wages of sin is death. Close the book. Sorry. It doesn't stop there. The verse goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And this takes us back to Jesus. This takes us back to the cross. Back to the resurrection. You see, a legal transaction happened on the cross. God made a judicial decision because he is the eternal judge. And he sent his son. Because judgment has to be made for our sin. God is a perfect judge. He will not just forgive. He has to judge sin. And so the perfect judge sent a perfect lamb, a perfect man, Jesus, fully God, fully man, He lived a sinless life, and he went to the cross, and on that cross, God placed the entirety of your and my sin debt. And he judged it. And he paid for it. A legal transaction happened there. God paid for your sins. Because God is love. God is love. He loves you. And He loves you so much that He took upon Himself the judgment of your sin. He didn't have to do it. It wasn't a requirement. He chose to do it. He did it because He loves you. John 3.16, you've all heard this verse. Wonderful verse. Jesus says these amazing words. He says, For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Do you know that you are included in everyone? You're included. Everyone's included. Everyone that will trust Christ. Turning from their sin. Repentance is a scary word. You have to repent, you know, and we think, oh, do I have to be perfect to get there? No. I'm not perfect. Never even come close. But I agree with God that sin is sin. I turned from loving sin and desiring sin and saying, I want to sin, which is the heart and mind of an unbeliever. It's our propensity. That's how we're naturally born. But you agree with God. That's sin. That's wrong. And you turn from it and you say, I'm going to accept that you paid for my sin. That Jesus, you are who you said you were. That indeed, you are the Son of God. And in truth, you paid for my sin. And you did rise from the dead. And you've conquered death and hell for me. For all those, for everyone, that will turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and trust Him for your salvation, the Bible promises you, God the one who breathes stars, the one who created everything, the one who holds it all together by the power of His will, has promised to you today that if you will trust Him, if you will put your faith in Him, He will forgive you of all of your sin. He'll forgive you of all of your past sin. He will save you from your present struggle with sin. And He will bring you grace to save you in the future and bring you into the kingdom. He will give you eternal life. There is this terrifying statistic. I don't know if you ever heard this. 
but 100 out of 100 people die. It's a very scary statistic. But I got a better one for you. 100 out of 100 people that trust Christ for their salvation receive eternal life. It's guaranteed because he's not dead. Because he rose from the grave. Because death could not keep him. Jesus proved who he was. He's alive. And he's my Savior. He's my Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, who was born of a virgin, fully God, and fully man, lived a sinless life, and willingly went to the cross. He went alone. He went forsaken. But He did not forsake us. He bore our sins on that cross. He bore your sins. Yours. Everything you've ever done that was contrary to the will of God, He bore on that cross because He loves you. And three days later, the stone was rolled away and He physically, bodily, rose from the dead, killing death and conquering hell for you and I. So I want to ask you this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Are you trusting Christ for your salvation today? Do you know, do you know that if you die tonight, that you're going to go to heaven? Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Do you know this? Are you sure of this? You can be. You can be. This morning, you can be sure. This morning, you can know. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, At just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Today. 